That was my stomach, I think. Uh, so I was, so I was preparing today to preach this sermon, and I prepared on Monday, and I'd spent all week, and I thought about it all week. And the thing that I thought about this week was that there's more to being a Christian than church. And it doesn't define us so much that we come to church. It defines us. That is it. I told you. You know the technology messes up on its own and I'm just a help. So we're having fun with this. What's going on? Hello. Possession. Got it. Okay. That's fine. But today we're going to look at something and from this you can see it. There are weightier matters in the law. There are bigger things to Christianity than those three hours each week. There is more than just showing up to service. There is showing up to serve. And I'm focusing this on all week. And then yesterday I caught myself. I was talking to this guy named Tom. And he caught me. Because I've been asking everybody, do you go to church? And he goes, I don't really care if anybody goes to church. I don't know if they're a Christian. Ouch. Sometimes the Lord smacks you in the face. Sometimes he hits you square. That was the Lord in me square. Because I prepared all week for this and I thought about it and I was like, it's not about going to church. And then what I catch myself doing? I was concerned, are you going to church? I wasn't concerned, are you a Christian? I'm glad there were others there who were smart enough to figure out what they were really trying to ask. And then we're, we, we had two baptisms. Because guess what? Terry figured out the real question. She wanted to know if they were Christians. She wanted to know if they actually had a relationship with God. She didn't just want to know if everything was as usual. <coughs> Romans chapter 12 will be our verse today. We're going to start in Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, we're going to start with hypocrisy. And this theme of let love be without hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is, is not a negative word, actually. Hypocrisy is actually a neutral word. How many of you have went to a movie? How many of you have met a movie star? Did you go up to him and go, so you play Batman, right? And you go, oh, you, there's a crime over here you need to go fix. And he's like, I play Batman. And you say, okay, there's a crime going on next door. Go, you know, go do your Batman thing. Throw your boomerangs or something. No, we wouldn't do that. We wouldn't go, well, you play that character. Go, you know, fulfill the role in real life. I saw you in that movie, you were Batman. And he has to finally tell you and say, that's just me being an actor, a hypocrite. That's me playing a role for you to enjoy. But then you don't expect that same person to turn around and do that actual work. You don't expect them to go from going to service to turn that around and going to serve. So we're in Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. <clears throat> Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence. Fervent spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Persevering in tribulation. Devoted to prayer. Contributing to the needs of the saints. Practicing hospitality. Let love be without hypocrisy. But it's so much easier to go to Day of Hope and do what I did. And go, well, you're going to church somewhere. Okay, you. Okay. Well, thank you for coming. Enjoy your food. Go on your way. It's so easy to get caught in this and not be like, love needs to be genuine. Do you notice our religion is no longer a religion? Our religion is a relationship. He says, he, Jesus tells us of the law. And he tells us two things that tell you the whole law. Love God. What? Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the whole law. 618 commandments, and we're summing it up with love God and love your neighbor. That is not a religion. That is a relationship. 
Love is in a relationship. You don't love nothing. There's always an object of your received love. And we're going to talk about this. And what we're talking about here is hypocrisy. Because if you come here, and it's not about relationship with God, you've actually just wasted your time. You could have probably slept through this time and had at least gotten something out of it. But it challenges us here, and it says, let love be without hypocrisy. And in the passage we read from Matthew, we see what the Pharisees were doing. We see that they went to the cup, and there was a rat in their cup. And there was a flea on that rat, so they take out their tweezers out of their purse, right? They get those tweezers out of their bag, and they're trying to get that flea out of their drink. Because nobody wants a flea in their drink. And so they're picking at this rat, trying to go, oh, i got to get that flea out. And that's what he describes it. He says, straining out a gnat, but swallowing a whole camel. Missing everything that's big. Missing justice, mercy, faithfulness. Because they were worried about mint and cumin and dill and making sure every little thing had been tithed. And the reality is, that does not fit our challenge today. Let love be without hypocrisy. He says, abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. That has nothing to do with going to church. That has everything to do with the difference between being indoctrinated and knowing the right stuff and being empowered. You have not received a spirit of weakness, but of power. The difference is, church as usual, learn some doctrine, good, you know the right answers, you know the right stuff, go about your merry way. And in here it says, cling to what is good. That idea of gripping it, squeezing it, and not letting go. Those don't look anything like religion. Those look like a child crying. Reaching out, squeezing, wanting its mother, cling to that good. And the, and the word abhor, hate evil. This is not about knowing the right stuff. It's about doing it and seeking it out and letting it be more than a ritual, a rote mode, something we do on Sundays. He continues with, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligent, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. You can't learn something and then call that serving God. It's the same as reading how to do something and then going, that's neat. I know, I now know how to serve God. Okay, let me go. Let me continue with my life. But it says be devoted. Do you see the strong language here? Be devoted. Devotion. That concept of love. That concept of I can't see anything because I'm so focused. Devoted. Persevering in tribulation. Devoted to prayer. Contributing to the needs of saints. Practicing hospitality. None of which can be done effectively here. Cannot be fully carried out. He continues in verse 14 with one more challenge of this. Let love be without hypocrisy. He says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Ouch. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. That's not religion right there. Religion is quick... Is tit for tat, right? I do this, you do that, it works out. The religion, Jesus even criticized the old law when he said, You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy. Last week we talked about how Jesus says something like, You have to be willing to give your life, and he means everything up to your life, because that is everything. When he says, Love your enemy, he means everything up to your enemy. 
Because nothing is worse than trying to love your enemy. And he tells us to not only do that, but to bless them. Think about praying for them. And not a prayer just, you know, Lord, fix them. But a Lord, God, I, I hope they're blessed. I hope everything goes great for them today. Now, I don't, I don't know what your enemy is, but we've all got them. We've got those people that either they just grate on our nerves, or they have decently wronged us. They have done something extreme. And he doesn't give any distinction. He says, anybody who's persecuted you, Bless them. And he continues and says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never. I love those extreme words. Never. Pay back evil for evil to any it's a list of extreme words. Never. Evil. Anyone. Never evil to anyone. You always heard to fight fire with fire. And you know, there are times when firefighters use it. But firefighters don't show up to a house and go, I've got my fire. They show up with a big truck filled with water. And nobody gets surprised and go, well, why didn't you bring some fire with you? Because that's the exception. Because that's odd. That's unusual. And the fact is the only way to fight evil is with good. Do, do, you, do you really think that if we are to be the image of God, that it works with God to go, God, will you become evil and beat Satan? But we feel that we can beat our enemy by becoming like them. God isn't going to be like Satan and beat him at his game. He shows how good he is. When the devil attacks us, he doesn't join in the game. He sends his son. When he comes and tempts in the garden, God already said, I'm going to get you. But he doesn't come. Did you notice how he didn't come? He didn't come and just destroy Satan. He came with love. For God so loved the world. Strong images, isn't it? Because God, as our model of perfection, never becomes evil to be evil. But we're so quick to think, well, we can beat this evil with another evil. The Church of Christ has this history that's beautiful. It, during the Civil War, if there was ever a time to hate your enemies, this was you know, probably the time in America to do it. And you had the Methodist Church, and they split. You had the Wesleyan and the United Methodist, and they split. You had the Presbyterian, Southern and Northern, they split. You had the Baptist. They still have the Southern Baptist Convention, Northern Baptist Convention. Guess where it came from? 1840. We're just starting out. The Church of Christ has this idea, let's go back to the book, let's start out. Let's do things right. And there's this question, you know, do we take out this evil with evil? And he says, no. He says, we've got something more important. We have something that none of these other groups have. We have the ability not to divide. And his whole argument during this time was this. We have the ability not to divide like everyone else. We have this opportunity to show the world that we are so different that we don't switch to evil. We don't go, oh, we've got some people on the south, we've got some people in the north. Oh, separate, divide. He says there is something more important than all of that. And gives us that same challenge that we never, it doesn't have any exceptions, does it? Never doesn't have exceptions. Never pay back evil for evil. To anyone. No exceptions there either. But we go on to verse 17. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, 
So far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil. Be at peace with all men, as far as it depends on me. Never take my own revenge against my own word. So often we want to take God's word and we want it to say what we want it to say. This is not what I want it to say. I'm from the South. If you've ever heard of Texas pride, it's about as big as anything you're going to find in this country. And Texas pride is pretty strong. Actually, it's very strong. You don't meet a Texan and make a mistake of calling the wrong state. It's just a bad idea. But we're not real peaceful people. We're not. You always fight for what's right. I don't remember what the country saw and what, who sang it. But it said you got to stand for something or you fall for anything. You gotta be your own man, not a puppet on string. And that's the slogan of where I'm from. And it was this it was my enemy messes with me, I conquer. I used to love fighting. Me and my brother would go out and just go to a place where we could find a good fight. And then God comes in and messes with everything, and he says, So far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Don't take your own revenge. And then he goes one step further. And it's one thing not to come back at my enemy. It's easy to say, okay, my enemy came at me. I'm going to forgive you. Do you know it doesn't stop, though? The Lord is real good at saying, okay, here's a little bit. You know, you could not punch him in the face. But he doesn't stop there, does he? He says this, he says, but if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. It's no longer I find that enemy and I'm not mean to them. It's I find that enemy and I love them. I find that enemy and I say, God, why would you put something so hard to do in here? And you see at the end, he says, do not be overcome by evil. We think that by using evil, we can beat evil in this world. But there's a risk in that, is that we be overcome. When you start doing that, when you start taking your own revenge, when you start carrying out God's wrath for him, taking care of his stuff instead of letting him handle stuff, there is a huge risk of being overcome. But he tells us there is a way to overcome. We can overcome evil with good. A couple weeks ago, there was a shooting. The man goes into Charleston Church, this African American church, and Dylan Roof comes in there. They greet him, they welcome him, they're loving on him. They don't know this guy, they're loving on him. And he comes in, he shoots them up. And as usual, you know, the victims get a chance to speak to the person who's done them wrong. And they took this time instead of talking about anything about, you know, you should feel terrible about what you've done. You know what you've done. They took this time to talk to him about forgiveness. They told him instead of saying, you've killed people I love. You've destroyed something that is beautiful and perfect. I forgive you. And instead of taking that opportunity to overcome evil and try it in a way that we become overcome by evil, we go at it and we do as it says. We overcome evil with good. If 
you know anything about where I came from, this is a hard passage. But there's a lot of us who have come from this, and this is a hard passage. Because I, I once asked my master chief, I said, is it okay if I were to give someone water? I used to work on pods, they're carriers. They do missions. They take, they deliver stuff to the boat, but they also deliver stuff to Haiti when there's a drought. And I love my job. And a, one of my higher ups came and asked me a question that I took to my master chief because I had no answer. He said to me, is it okay if I feed my animal? He said, is it okay, you know, we're, we're dropping bottles of water and helping Haiti. We're helping after the tsunami. He goes, would it be okay if we did the same thing in Iraq? He's expecting to come to me and I, he's like, well, you were a preacher. You tell me what the Bible says about this. I did everything I could to keep him dry. That's all I did. I just stood there and said, okay. I don't even think that's an answer to anything, but I said, oh, okay. all he was asking is, if they're the enemy, can he give them food and water? He wasn't asking because he didn't know the answer. He was asking because he wanted to know how Christians could be such hypocrites. And all I could say to him was, okay. All I could say is, okay, you got me. It changed everything for me. And you don't have to agree with me on this, but it is something that you need to look at. Is God challenges us to do something so radical in changing us? I don't like to personalize too much. I don't want you to get this. It's about me. It's not about me. It's about the fact that this word it should change us. I went through a dark time. I got very depressed. I even got suicidal. Because I didn't understand how I could follow God. And you've probably heard me say it a lot, forgive so that you will be forgiven. Well, sometimes the hardest person to forgive is actually ourselves. And this was his challenge. If my enemy is hungry, I will feed him if I love God. That is love without hypocrisy. If my enemy is thirsty, I will give him a drink. That is love without hypocrisy. And being willing to do more than sin. Let me close with Acts 8, 35-39. So the scene is set this way. You have a chariot from Ethiopia going along the way. And he's reading from the book of Isaiah, just trying to understand, striving to understand. Philip comes up to him and he says, do you understand what you're reading? Well, how can I without somebody to explain it to me? It's a beautiful story, but it fits in so well here. Because God tells Philip, go run up to that chariot and just run and start talking to him. Run at an armed chariot. This is a good idea. Think about this. You've got an armed chariot. you got plenty of guards there. This is an Ethiopian eunuch. He's got a decent amount of importance. Run at his chariot. See how that works for you. But he does. And what's he here when he gets there? He has God already setting the stage. I don't want to close negative, I want to close positive. Because when we love without hypocrisy, this is the kind of things that happen. He loved, he said, I love whoever that is. So he goes up to him and he just starts listening. And he's reading Isaiah and he's like, do you understand? No. Let me tell you. Then Peter opened his mouth. Verse 35, then Peter opened his mouth and began at this scripture. Preached Jesus to him. 
Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. And he baptized him. Now when they had came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, but went on his way rejoicing. He loved without hypocrisy, and what do you get? This eunuch goes away in Christ, rejoicing. So we, we, we are challenged here to love without hypocrisy. This is, it passes with a lot of challenges. And it's a challenge that keeps pushing us. But the thing is, you have to remember, at the end you get a result that is beautiful. Terry remembered this weekend something I did. Christianity is more about going to church than about just going to church. I wish I'd remember that sooner. She did. How many of y'all know that there were two baptisms this weekend? Because Terry remembered what was really important. Can you remember that it is more about serving God and being God, being in a relationship with God, than it is about just coming to church? One, she showed up. Awesome. But two, she didn't ask the same question I was asking, like a dummy. You go to church somewhere? Yeah? Okay, good. See ya. Let me get your food. Let me take care of you. She was asking, do you know Jesus? And that same invitation we extend today with beautiful results. He went on his way rejoicing. Because when you love without hypocrisy and know what it's all about. Beautiful. So today we're, we're offered an invitation. Have you believed what he says? That he is the Son of God. That Jesus is Lord. I mean, confessed Him as Lord. I mean, repented of our sins, being buried and joined with Him in baptism so that we can live for Him and go on our way rejoicing. If there's anybody who needs to be united with Christ or you haven't been living out your faith and you want prayers or if you need prayers from the body or if you want to be joined in this church, we ask you to come now as we sing and as we sing.